I'm going to ask you to turn to John 4. John chapter 4. On this Palm Sunday. So glad everyone's here today. Good to see you. Good to see you. visitors that are visiting today. I hope you feel welcome and sense the love of the Lord. And, and if you're visiting with us for the first time, I hope between now and the end of the service that you would fill out a card. There's a connection card in the pew there. We we'll just fill out a connection card, give it to an usher on the way out, and we got a little gift that we want to give you, and thank you for coming, and, and uh, welcome everybody online who's watching online, all the various streaming services. I'm going to continue today with Amazing Grace. That's the series that we're in, is, is in Amazing Grace. And today I'm going to preach on an encounter with the grace of God. Don't you just love God's grace? Boy, I, I, I need you more. I need you more. I, I, every day we need God's grace. And we, and we need to be reminded of God's grace today. And, uh, you know, we've been in series, several in the Old Testament, Nehemiah and Ruth. But I just felt like we need to come back to the Gospels for a few weeks. And I love coming back to the Gospels. And just simple little Bible stories from the Gospel. You know, the grace... Grace is the undeserved, unmerited favor of God. Jesus is grace. Grace is a person. Grace is Jesus. Jesus is grace personified. And, and, and you'll probably know the story this morning, the little Bible story this morning. You've probably heard it in Sunday school or wherever. But don't you just love going back and reading those Bible stories from the Gospels on how Jesus, he encounters People that are just down on their luck. They, they're just been through the muck and mire and they come to Jesus and receive grace and they become changed and new beings. And that's what we're going to look at today. The story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4 in verse 3 says that he left Judea. This is Jesus and he departed again to Galilee. And then it says, but he needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go through Samaria. You got to understand the context of, of the times in, in this in first century Palestine. There was, there was hatred, there was strife between the Jews and the Samaritans. And, when, and this is one of those scriptures that it's easy for us to look over if we don't know the context. There was, there was a lot of prejudice in those days between the Jews and the Samaritans. They hated each other. And if a Jew was going to go, say, somewhere on the other side of Samaria, the Jew would not go through Samaria. The Jew would go around Samaria. There's no way I'm passing through Samaria because the Jews hated the Samaritans and vice versa. So we, what's, what's interesting about this scripture is, is that if a first century Jew was reading this, they might take it to mean like, because they, they know, <laughs> we, we don't think too highly of the Samaritans. So they might take it to mean that, well, well, Jesus, he had to go through Samaria because there was no other option for him. There's no way that, I mean, this is, I'm, I'm thinking like a Jewish person reading this. There's no way that, that Jesus would voluntarily go through Samaria. Maybe a road was out. Maybe there was a traffic jam. <laughs> You know, a, a horse and a cart uh, messed up, blocked the road or something. And they had to detour through Samaria. There's no way that Jesus is going to pass through Samaria on his own. But as you'll see, though, that wasn't the case because Jesus willfully went to Samaria. A, a, a better way to read it is, is that he wasn't forced to go to Samaria. He, it's like he had to go to Samaria. I've... I've got to get to Samaria. I, I, I'm, I'm going to go out of my way to go to Samaria. That's how it should be in, in that light. It's like Jesus looked on his divine calendar, <laughs> his, his first century iPhone, and he saw that on this date, he had to go to Samaria to meet a specific person at a specific time in a specific place. And this is the day, ding, ding, ding. This is the day that I've got to go to Samaria. 
You know, what's interesting about this as I set up this, this little message is just that scripture right there. That, that's a sermon in itself. He had to go through Samaria. He had to get to Samaria. He had to get to a person in Samaria. There was a person in Samaria that needed God's grace, that needed his grace. And I'm going to get to that person. That's a message in itself. Because what's, what's so amazing about grace? One of the things that's amazing about grace is that grace will hunt you down and chase you and find you until it corners you. I'm, I'm coming for you. This is grace. Grace is relentless. Grace will, will, will search and, and go to forbidden places to seek you out. Maybe that's your testimony. Maybe I, I bet that's somebody's testimony that, that you were going this way instead of going that way. You were running from God. You were rebelling and you were living out in the world and trying to, to find happiness out in the world while all along maybe there was somebody at home, a, a mother, a father that was praying for you, a church that was praying for you, a pastor, someone was praying for you and you're out there running or oblivious oblivious I'm I'm in Samaria I'm in a forbidden place while all along somebody's praying and lo and behold grace finds me in Samaria <laughs> and grace saves my life anybody have a testimony like that that grace found me when I was in a place that I should not have been that's the grace of God it's relentless it's chasing you. It, it'll come after you. And, and maybe right now, maybe there's someone here today, there's someone watching right now. You're running from God. You, you've, been, you've been in a place of, of rebellion. Or maybe, maybe you're not necessarily running from God, but you just feel worthless and, and, and you, you just, you're just worthless and, and hopeless. Well, 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 grace has found you here today. Grace is here right now. He's found you. Do you know that, that before the world began, God knew today was going to happen? Do you know that God had you on his calendar before he created the world? He knew that on this Palm Sunday, you would be here at Community Church. You'd be watching online, and there would be a preacher that would be preaching on the grace of God. And I, and I got news for you. If that's you, today's the day grace is going to find you, and grace is going to touch your life and restore joy back to your life. Grace is going to deliver you today. I believe that. So grace is relentless. Look at verse 5. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Now this is in, unusual in itself here. This was an unusual time of day for a woman to come to the well. It was even more unusual for the woman to come alone. In those days, the women went of the village went to the well together. And they went in the cool of the day. They wouldn't have come in the, in the heat of the day. They, they, they would have come in a group together. Kind of like how you women go to the bathroom together for some strange reason. <laughs> They've got to come to the well together. <laughs> so this is odd in itself. That a woman came to the well at this time of day alone. We'll find out that, that the reason she was alone is because she's got a rough past. She's got a reputation. So she's probably avoiding the other ladies. She's probably coming. She's avoiding other people. And, and they're probably trying to avoid her as well. It's probably a little bit of both. So she comes alone. She don't want to have to be 
with the crowd because she's inside, she's, she's facing rejection. Inside, she, she feels shame and hurt and pain. She knows they're talking about her, so she's isolating herself and coming to the well by herself. But, but, it, but Jesus, see, Jesus knew this was going to happen. So Jesus, he, he spots this girl out. He knows this is the one. And he asks her, would you give me some water? Would you give me some drink? Now, this surprises this woman who is alone. First of all, you're a Jew. You're talking to me. You're interested in me. You're su she, she's surprised. She's, she's shocked. <laughs> and look what it says in verse 9. That, that she said to him, well, how is it that you being a Jew... Ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now she's really confused. First of all, a Jew is talking to me, he wants a drink. And now he's talking about living water. <laughs> water that, that'll quench my thirst. Where one little drop of water and I'll never have to. She, she's, she's more confused. Of course, she's only thinking in physical terms. She's only thinking about physical water. Look what she says in verse 11. She says, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw, nor, nor will I have to come back and, and draw. <laughs> she don't want to be there in the first place. So we see she wants the water. I, I want this water. But she's still thinking in physical terms. She's still thinking in terms of physical water. She doesn't understand that, that Jesus, he's, he's using a metaphor. He's talking about everlasting life. This water, this refreshing that comes from me. So, so in verse 16, after the little ambiguous game Jesus is playing with her, he decides, well, I'm just going to go on in and I'm going to be frank with her. And he just, he just speaks to her direct then. He says in verse 16, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And then Jesus said, you're right. <laughs> for you, that you have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. Do you think he's got her attention now? <laughs> You're right. You don't have one husband. You've had five. <laughs> and the one you're living with right now is not your husband. I mean, she, 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 <laughs> he's got her attention now. He just decides to go straight in and expose what she's hiding. What, what, what she's, all, all the, the, the sin that's inside her, the, the pain that's inside her. See, she's been looking for love. What, what he's showing here is that she's been looking for love and fulfillment in all the wrong places. She's been looking to this man to satisfy her. Like Jerry Maguire, remember that? You complete me. You ain't going to find no completion in a guy. Only Jesus can complete you. Dude, come on. Somebody say amen. If you don't say amen, say oh me. I'm telling you, ladies, you ain't going to find completion in a guy. Completion comes in Jesus Christ. She's been looking to, to guys to complete her. She's been looking for fulfillment in all the wrong places, like a country song, looking for love in all the wrong places. She hadn't found it yet. And Jesus calls her out on it. She's empty. She's dry. 
This one left her. That one left her. This one left. She's going to this one. Going to that. It's the sa- you, you notice it's the same cycle. It, it, it's the same cycle. This one did this to me. And then you get right back with someone else who does the same thing. You leave. You get back with something. It's just the same cycle. She, she's empty. She's dry. She's broken. And there's no need to pretend that everything's okay when it's not okay. Jesus knows it's not okay. And he's, G- and, and he's using water as the metaphor. It, it, it's the perfect metaphor. Because he, he's like, you're coming to this well trying to find refreshing, trying to find satisfaction, but this water only gives you temporary satisfaction. Just like all those guys, they only give you temporary satisfaction. But, but I'll give you something that'll satisfy everything you're looking for. I'll give you everlasting life. I'll give you true fulfillment. My grace is available to satisfy your every need. And the implication that Jesus is is trying to convey to this woman is that He's there to heal. He's there to redeem. He's there to offer grace. But He can't heal and redeem what you don't acknowledge. He can't. He knows what's inside your heart. He he knows the hurt. He knows the pain. He knows the reject. He's there saying, help me help you. But he can't help you if you're not willing to acknowledge what needs to be helped. So she's She's, she's covering, she's hiding. That's, that's why she's in isolation. That's why she's coming at this time of day. I don't want anybody else to know. They're talking about me. She, this woman, she's a mess. And see, this is hard for us. I mean, we are this woman right here. Because it's the same for us. Because our natural, the, the natural human nature is to run when the going gets tough. The natural human nature is to try to cover up sin, shame, how we feel. Specifically for guys, now we're doing our Bible st- a study on the Mondays, the first and third Mondays. And, and somebody will come up, you know, guys, Pastor Keith, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Well, inside, you're not doing fine. But guys are going to cover it up. We got to have it all together. We run We hide, we cover up pain, we cover up shame, we cover up rejection, just like Adam and Eve when they sinned in the garden. It goes all the way back to the beginning, doesn't it? What what did they do when, when they recognized that they were naked, that they have sinned against God? They ran and hid, and they tried to clothe themselves with the fig leaves. But the truth about grace, after we have had a collision with it. After it's chased us down and it's confronted us, here's the truth about God's grace. If we want to experience the healing power of grace, if we want to experience the redemption of grace, we've got to face the truth about ourselves and quit covering up what God already knows about us. See, this series is about experience. Experiencing God's grace. It's not about knowing more about God's grace. I think most of you probably know enough about grace to get you by where you at least make a C on a quiz. This isn't about knowing more about grace. This is about experiencing God's grace. And the truth about God's grace is you will never experience it as long as you keep covering up and hiding what God already knows is on the inside. You know, true confession of sins, when we talk about confession of sins, true confession of sins is not all of us, it's not like we're revealing something about ourselves that God doesn't know about. Oh God, I confess, I have lusted and looked at another woman. I confess, it's like God does, oh, oh, wow, I didn't know that. I'm sorry, God. I looked at something I shouldn't look at. I did something. Oh, oh, shame, shame, shame. (laughs) That's 
as if God is shocked. Come on. Confession, the word confess means to say the same thing. Confession is saying something about yourself that God already knows about you and is just getting it out into the light because as long as it's hid in the dark, grace can't ex touch it. But when it's exposed and brought out into the light, that's when God can redeem it and turn that thing around. See, that's confession of sin. It's saying the same thing. God, you already know this, but I acknowledge it myself. I did this. I did that. I'm suffering right now. I, I need your help. I need your grace. Oh, God, please touch me. Touch me. You see that? It's coming out into the light. And little does this woman know that everything she's looking for is right there at that well. Everything she's been, everything she's looking for is right in front of her. All her shames, all her regrets, all her sin and pain can be washed away with this encounter with grace. And what I want to do now, though, is I want to make a little shift. And I want to give you three quick points here. Here's my points that I want to give you. Because... Grace was there to meet that woman. But that woman could not receive grace unless she put away and disregarded the false assumptions that she had about Jesus. See, that's what was prohibiting this woman from receiving God's grace. She had false assumptions about Jesus. I'm going to give you the three false assumptions according to this passage that this woman had. And we're guilty of having these false assumptions as well. We got to overcome these things if we're going to experience God, God's grace. The first false assumption she had was this. Jesus wants nothing to do with me. Verse 9, notice she said, how, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? You know, it's, it's not, it's, notice a Samaritan woman. You know the times back in those days, don't you? It, it's not that I'm a Samaritan. It's that I'm a Samaritan. There is no way a man is going to ask a woman that he doesn't. Will you do? Oh, how, what do you want with me? That's what she said. What do you want with me? You, you don't want anything to do with me. But see, the point is here is, is that it's not that. It's not that she, she doesn't want an encounter with grace. Of course she wants an encounter with grace. Who doesn't want an encounter with unmerited favor, with undeserved favor? The problem is she's convinced herself that grace doesn't want to have an encounter with her. We want grace, don't we? We all want grace. But the problem so often is, is we convince ourselves that grace doesn't want us. What do you want with me? Hence the reason why we hide and we, we cover up. So often when people are constantly experiencing pain and, and rejection, uh, j just like the natural tendency is to run, another natural uh, tendency is to start building up walls. I've experienced so much pain. I've experienced so much shame and rejection. Well, I'll build up a wall to keep others from getting close to me. That way I won't have to experience any more pain. In, in essence, that's, that's what we can extrapolate from this. That she's built up a wall. I've been hurt. I'm not going to let you get in and hurt me. And given this woman's history, she's probably right. She's probably trying to avoid putting herself in a position of vulnerability so that she doesn't have to face more rejection. So it's not that she doesn't want grace. It's that she thinks grace doesn't want her. But grace does want her. That's why Jesus had to go to Samaria. And that's why grace wants you he had to come looking for you he had to meet you here today do you know uh, Luke 19 10 says for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost 
He came to seek and to say, he came to seek you out and me out. I know you've heard this said, but, but, but it, we, it, it, we just need to understand this, that, that, that we've heard it said that, if, that if, if you were the last person on earth, Jesus would have still come and went to the cross. Well, that's the truth. He would have still come and went to the cross because he came to seek out the lost. Jesus does want something with you. He wants you. He wants your heart. He wants to give you his grace. So we've got to overcome that first false assumption that Jesus wants nothing to do with me. The second false assumption the woman had is that Jesus is more interested in religion than me. What in the world, where'd that come from? Well, look at the very next verse in verse 19. The woman said to him, now remember, Jesus just exposed her. <laughs> He just exposed what's on the inside. And then she says, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. So now she tries to divert attention away from her and she tries to play the religious card. Verse 20, she says, Our fathers, our forefathers worshipped on this mountain. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to. To worship. See, notice that when Jesus exposes what she's been covering up, she immediately tries to steer the conversation away from herself by talking about religious things, by talking about liturgy, by talking about traditions, just trying to, to, to get away from the hard fact of having to, to, to face what's on the inside of me. She steers it away to religion. The grace of God is about to touch her life. And notice she's changing the subject to legalistic worship rituals. All of us, I mean, it's like our fathers worshiped on this mountain. In other words, well, this is how we worship. This is where we're supposed to worship. This is, we're supposed to do it this way. I mean, she just goes off. On, it has nothing to do with our conversation, does it? Just randomly, you're a prophet. Blah, 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 blah. And, and the, the fact is Jesus could care less at that. He's not concerned about her religious knowledge. He's not concerned about what she knows. You know, that's another tendency. We tend to get a little pious when Jesus gets a little too personal. We tend to, we, we start to feel the, the Holy Spirit's conviction or say we're talking to somebody and isn't it, isn't it amazing, especially if you've been churched up or you know a little, you know a little bit about church and, and stuff and, and, all, and all of a sudden you start to feel the, the spirit convicting and you're having a conversation and all of a sudden you've got to steer the conversation over to some religious thing that doesn't even matter. Debating religious issues. I have that. I figured out in my time of ministry that when I've got someone that's always wanting to debate, to debate me about every little religious issue and everything about the Bible and this and that, about things that don't even matter, I've pretty much pegged it. That person's got something to hide. <laughs> I've, pe I've pegged it. That person that goes around looking all Mr. Religious and Mrs. Religious and, and you know, they're coming to, they're doing this and, and they're pointing out everybody's wrong and they're preaching that this person and that person, how dare you do this and how dare you do that. Oh, l let me give you a clue. That person's got something to hide because that's a natural tendency. When Jesus gets personal, we get pious. And try to re revert the attention away to the issue at hand. See, that's just, it's called self-defense. It's, it's just that defense mechanism. Jesus could care less about this woman's religious views. Jesus could care less. You know, we, we try to, maybe when, you, maybe when you feel convicted by the Spirit, maybe when you sense something, it, it's, it's, it's easy also to go back into works and go back into law. Well, God, I'm doing this for you. God, I'm doing that for you. God, I'm coming to church every week. God, I'm teaching Sunday school. God, I'm singing on, even on the praise team. God, I'm doing this. 
let me into heaven God I'm, look what all I'm doing see, see that's going into religion but Jesus doesn't care about religion it's not acknowledging religion that sets you free it's acknowledging that you're a sinner and you're, you got a lot of junk inside of you and unless you just become vulnerable and get it out there that until then you'll never experience God's grace and I'm going to tell you it's hard work being religious It is hard. I mean, 613 commands. And if you break one, you're guilty of breaking them all. Well, I've never killed anybody. Well, Jesus said, if you ever had bitterness or hatred in your heart, that's the same as murder. Well, I've never cheated on my wife. Well, Jesus said, if you've ever went to the beach and lusted at a woman in a bikini, you committed adultery. See, see, see what I'm saying? It, 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 it's hard work. Jesus said, I'm not concerned about your religion. I'm concerned about your heart. So she had to overcome this false assumption that Jesus cares more about religion than he does about me. And the third assumption Jesus is making an offer that's too good to be true this is just too simple this is just too good to be true see ultimately it's, it's hard for this woman to grasp what Jesus is trying to give her again consider her history she's had all kinds of men make all kinds of false promises I'll give you this. I'll give you this. I'll be your knight in shining armor only to be let down. So she's, so she's obviously, she, she's, she's trying to protect herself. This is just too good to be true. And Jesus comes offering grace. And she's questioning, is he serious? Does, does, he, really, does he really mean this? See, when we've made a mess of things, when we've been hurt time and time again, sometimes it's hard to imagine that grace is for us. It's hard to, it's hard to, to grasp what would grace want anything? Why would grace want me? Why would grace want me? Many spend their life running from God because they think that God's chasing us to beat us down. I almost, I get a picture of, of grandma on her curlers and her robe holding the roller pin, chasing after little Johnny. You, I'm going to wear you out, boy. I'm going to wear you out. You know, it's like God is chasing after us to beat us down and, and, and give us, I'm going to give you what you deserve. I'm going to beat you down. But ultimately, grace is running after us to give us what we don't deserve. Unmerited favor. Undeserved grace. Don't you know that the psalmist said, surely, truly, goodness and mercy is chasing me. God's not running after you to beat you down. God's running after you so he can shower his goodness upon you and his grace and his mercy upon you. That's our heavenly father. But it just seems too good to be true. Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.14, and I'm reading this in the Amplified Version, it says, and the grace, the unmerited favor and blessing of our Lord actually flowed out, and, I, and, I, and that's why I chose this version, because he says it flowed out super abundantly. <laughs> that's like a little 10-year-old word almost. It's super abundantly, <laughs> awesomely abundantly. It flowed out super abundantly and beyond measure for me, accompanied by faith and love 
that are to be realized in Christ Jesus. See, God's grace flows super abundantly beyond measure for us. So the fact is, here's the fact. Grace does seem nearly too good to be true. But that's the reason it's called grace. That's why it is grace. Because grace is nearly too good to be true. As a matter of fact, if it's not nearly too good to be true, it's not grace. It's not gospel. Gospel means, if you want to get serious and go back to the Greek literation, gospel means the nearly too good to be true good news of what Jesus has done to save sinners. If it doesn't seem nearly too good to be true, it's not gospel. It's not grace. So this woman, in verse 25, she said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Get the irony here. She's talking to Jesus. She's telling Jesus, one of these days, Jesus is going to come. <laughs> Jesus is there. <laughs> and she, You know, one of these days, Jesus is going to come. And I, and I can just, I don't know, but I can just imagine Jesus probably like smirked. <laughs> Because in verse 26, he's like, I who speak to you am he. I'm Jesus. Who you're looking for, I'm, I'm him. You know, this is the only time in the Gospels when Jesus opens up and candidly reveals his identity. You would think that Jesus would reveal his identity to a chief priest to a ruler, to a Pharisee trying to prove. You know, Jesus hid himself from the Pharisees, from the righteous people, from the self-righteous people. It's the only time that Jesus revealed himself. It was to a Samaritan woman. That's grace in itself, isn't it? <laughs> I'm Jesus. Verse 28, the woman then left her water pot, went her way. I mean, she's astounded. She can't believe it. I mean, it's just, she, she jumps up. She, she leaves her water pot. Get the picture. She's so excited. <laughs> she runs out into the city and she said to the men, that's another irony right there. The ones that abuse her. She's probably one of those, I don't want anything to do with men, men, men. I hate men. I, blah, blah, blah. And here she's going to a man to tell him about Jesus. Verse 29, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. And as I close and just wind this down, just, just, just go full circle. When she came... To the well, she came alone. She came ashamed. She, she was hiding pain. She was hiding rejection. People were talking about her. She was just in, ashamed. But, but this one encounter with grace changed everything. When she came, she was running from people. She has an encounter with grace. She's running to people. Telling what Jesus has done. See, that's what happens when you have an encounter with grace. I'm not talking about knowing grace. I'm talking about experiencing grace. When you have an encounter with grace, you come out from hiding in the dark. You come out of the isolation. You come out of the rejection. You come out from running from people. Locking myself up, staying to myself, building walls. I'm not going to let anybody get near to me. I'm not going to let in another person because they're not going to get in and cause more pain into my life. But see, when you have an encounter with grace, all of a sudden you come into the light. I've got everything I need. Everything I need is in Jesus. And instead of running from people, you even run to people, telling others, oh, look what Jesus Christ has done in my life, and he can do the same in your life. See, this is what happens with an encounter with God's grace. And I don't know how you came in here this morning. I, maybe you are like this Samaritan. You've got a wall around yourself. You're hiding. You're 
keeping things inside. You're harboring bitterness. You're harboring shame. You're harboring rejection. Maybe you're watching online because you feel ashamed to even come to church. Maybe that's why you're not coming to church. Because you feel unworthy. You have the false assumption that church is is for good people trying to get better. Church is not about good people trying to get better. Church is about dead people coming to life. Church is a hospital for the sick. It's a place of grace. I know there are places that are out there. I know that, there, I know that there's probably people in here or watching online that you've been hurt by church. You've been hurt by some denominations. They've judged you. Well, now you know the reason they've judged you is because they got stuff they're trying to hide. That's all. They fakers. They fakers. When we're honest with ourselves, we all need grace. We all need grace. I don't know how you came in, but I know how you can leave. You can leave like that woman today. You can leave like that woman with a fresh encounter of grace. Maybe you're a Christian. You, you know, you've received Jesus Christ. Yeah, I know about Jesus. But maybe you're burdened down and heavy laden. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Maybe you just need a fresh encounter with God's grace. Lighten the, let him lighten the load. You're striving, doing, doing, striving, doing, trying to measure up, trying to, to please God, trying to earn his grace, trying to earn his favor. You know, before Christians are notorious for this. Christians are notorious for knowing that it takes grace to get us in. It's all about Jesus to get us in. But once we get in, we think it's all about us to keep us in. We think it's all about our efforts to keep us in. When it's all grace got us in grace keeps us in it's grace that brought us safe thus far and grace will lead you home I want to ask you to bow your heads we are nothing apart from God's grace nothing if you're in here today and you've never truly received the grace of God, I want to give you an invitation this Palm Sunday. This Palm Sunday, I want to give you an invitation to receive Jesus, the grace of God. If you're watching online, I want to give you the opportunity this Palm Sunday to receive Jesus. Because in six days, Good Friday, it's good for us in that it's the culmination of the gospel but it wasn't good for Jesus because Jesus took our sin and took our shame and took the stripes and took the nails and was crucified on that old rugged cross. He did that as a measure of grace. Don't waste the cross. Don't waste what Jesus did for you by failing to receive the grace of God. It's not by your works. It's by his grace. It's through what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. And you, no, mat, no matter your past, you can receive Jesus right now. He can wash you clean. He can give you a fresh start. Receive Jesus today. Quit running from him. Quit running from him. His grace is here. One thing I know, he, His grace is here. One thing I don't know you, is if there's going to be a tomorrow for you. I know He's here now, but we don't know if there's going to be a tomorrow. Would you pray with me? I'm going to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Receive His grace today. Right where you're at, just pray from your heart. This is from your heart. Say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. Jesus, I know that I need you. I receive your grace today. Jesus, I confess my sins to you. Come on, God already knows. Why don't you open up and just confess? Just confess your sin. Sin covers it all. You don't have to name every single one of them. The fact is... we. We sin so much, we, we can't even keep track of it. So don't think you have to name this one, this one, this one. Just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. That covers all of them. I know I'm a sinner. <laughs> we've sinned since we've been in here. <laughs> I mean, oh, wretched man that I am, as Paul said. But, but his grace, that's why we need his grace. Like, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I confess my sin to you. 
save me. Jesus, I make you my Lord. I put you in authority of my life. And I thank you for saving me. Just a prayer like that. Just a simple prayer like that from your heart. It's all about your heart. Remember, Jesus could care less about religion. He could care less about your works, your actions, what you're doing, what you're not. He could care. The apostle Paul calls that dung. (laughs) He said, it's all counted as dung. Jesus said, I just want your heart, man. I just want your heart. And if you believed and if you prayed that prayer, he's asked you into his heart. Into, he, he's coming to your heart to save you. And I want to pray for the rest of you, Christian. Maybe you're overwhelmed. Maybe you need a fresh encounter with grace. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, for, for the rest of the Christians, Lord. I pray that we would have a fresh encounter with grace, a fresh, a fresh experience with your grace, Lord. That we would be people of grace. That we would be filled with your grace. That we, the, the gospel, that we'd be filled with the gospel. That we daily would, would just receive the toning sacrifice of Jesus Christ on a daily basis. Father, set us free from religious rituals. Set us free from tradition. Set us free from liturgy and, and, and thinking we have to do this to get that. Father, I just pray that we would become people of grace. A church of grace, Father. We need you so desperately, Father. 